From the magic of Zinch to the straightforward charging and eating forces of the Moor tribes, the very unique and admittedly somewhat one directional ogres are up next, but what they lack in finesse they often make up for with just sheer bulk and hitting power. So let's dive into their faction focus and see how things are changing for the Ogre Moor tribes going into the new edition. In terms of their battle traits, the Ogres keep their usual trampling charge rule, although it has changed somewhat. Instead of rolling a number of dice equal to your charge roll and then any sixes doing mortal wounds, now it is a much more straightforward impact hits style mechanic. You roll a d3 after you make a charge, and on a 2 plus on the d3, it does that many mortal damage. So you have a 66% chance of doing some mortal damage to an enemy after you've charged them with an ogre or a rhinox unit. It's not bad, and if you are doing a lot of charges with your units, which you will want to be doing with your ogres, this can do a good little bit of extra chip damage before the combats actually begin. They also get a bit of a boost to their mobility thanks to their hunger in Ravenous Brutes. This is just a simple passive that gives a flat plus two to run rolls for all ogre units as long as they haven't used the last rule in their battle traits which is called Feast on Flesh. And this is a new rule that is a once per battle ability and you can use it at the end of any turn and any ogre unit that is either in combat or has used a fight ability this turn. So even if they've charged in and then killed the enemy unit they were fighting, they will still get the benefit of this. But all of those units can roll a dice, they roll a d3, and on a two plus, they can either heal that many health, so either two or three health back on a unit, or they can inflict that much mortal damage onto an enemy unit they're in combat with. So you could end up doing three mortal damage as you charge in and then fight the enemy. And then if you use Feast on Flesh, do an additional three mortal damage at the end of the turn. So overall, they're not bad battle traits. They are definitely thematic and useful in the way you are gonna want to play your ogres. But I would say they're a bit more niche than some of the other traits we've seen for the other armies. They are obviously reliant on that charge roll or they are tied to this once per battle ability. So I think overall, they are maybe slightly less powerful than the other ones we've seen, but they are still quite good and thematic and can add up to a lot of extra damage over the course of the game. Their battle formation that we got shown, which is Beast Handlers, does help ramp up this damage somewhat. The rule for this formation is called Brutal Stock, and it has a very simple bonus that when a monster unit uses its trampling charge ability, you add one to any mortal damage inflicted. So now your monsters can be doing three or four mortal damage rather than two or three when they charge in. So it's not too shabby. And if you multi-charge with a couple of monsters into the same unit, you could quite feasibly kill off or at least seriously damage a whole unit or enemy hero before there's any fighting taking place. So comboing the two together, if you are running a monster heavy list, I think this is not a bad formation and it does tie in quite well with your battle traits. But again, it's a very, very niche one. And if you are just running one or two monsters and a bit more of a sort of combined arms style force, then maybe some of the other ones will be a better pick. But if you are going monster heavy, this does seem like it is going to add a noticeable amount of damage to your army over the game. In terms of the ogres and their magic and priests, they got a prayer shown off today. This is from the Everwinter prayer law, I guess, and it's called the Call of the Blizzard. This is chanted on a value of four, and it allows your priest to pick a terrain feature within 18 inches, and you place a blizzard token next to it. And this blizzard token gives the terrain feature the obscuring rule. But on top of that, if you wait a bit and get this prayer off with a chant value of 10, then until your next turn, all your Beast Claw Raider units within three inches of any terrain features with a blizzard token also get a five up ward. So this on its initial base value can definitely help you against a shooting heavy army thanks to the obscuring rule, but if you wait to empower it with more chanting power, like we saw with the Stormcast prayer the other week, this gets even better and it can spread that very powerful five up ward 
to quite a few of your units as well. So I think this is actually a really rather good prayer. It can definitely help keep your multi-wound models alive much longer. And if you just want that base obscuring version, getting it off on a four is not gonna take that long to do. On top of that, we also saw the usual four war scrolls. Notably, we saw Kragnos, who is the big scary god figure for the forces of destruction. And he's actually had quite a notable nerf in his stat line. He has lost his previously extremely rare and very, very powerful two plus save. This has now been dropped massively to just a four up save. So that is a fairly significant hit there. The blow was softened slightly by the fact his six up ward has been improved to a five up. So he's now sitting on a four up five up rather than a two up six up. So it is a bit of a downgrade, but it's not quite as bad as it initially looks. And against mortal damage, of course, it is actually a slight improvement. Aside from that though, he's got the standard non-degrading movement now, which is nice, and he still keeps mostly the same abilities. His End of Empires still gives you a 3d6 charge, essentially, to any destruction units wholly within 12 inches. The Avatar of Destruction still lets him ignore those instant death mechanics like Nagash's Hand of Dust, instead just doing a flat 6 damage to him, which can't be negated. Rampaging Destruction is still his super super swingy, but hilariously strong potentially, if it all goes right, ability that can let him do up to 36 mortal damage to an enemy. The biggest real change is his Shield in Violet, which no longer lets you roll 3d6 to beat a spell's casting value to ignore it. Instead, it has been simplified to just a 3-up roll on a d6. So it's much easier to remember and simpler now. I would say it's maybe a tad less reliable. Like, I haven't done the actual kind of figuring it out because it's quite awkward to do. A 3d6 roll on average is 11, so beating a cast value of most spells of 6 to 8 is quite likely. But still, a 3-up roll to ignore a spell is still very, very good. It still gives you a 66-odd percent chance to just outright ignore any spell on Kragnos. So it is still a very reliable and good extra layer of defense against any magic that is thrown his way. I would say overall he's probably got a bit squishier against regular attacks, but maybe a tad more resilient against those purely mortal damage hits. And then aside from that, he is still just a monstrous beat stick who can do a load of damage himself and also bring some quite nice buffs for your forces to get them into combat and make some of those riskier charges, which of course will tie in very well with the ogres because the more charges your ogres make, the more mortal damage they can do from their trampling charge. So I think he is going to tie in quite well with the, the ogre list in general. The Huskard on Stonehorn is up next, and likewise, he has had the movement change to a more constant, more reliable 10 inches. But aside from that, he keeps his regular 14 health and four up save. He is still a priest, so he can still chant some of those nice buffs for your forces, but he has had a few other interesting changes. He still has a choice of ranged weapons with the Chain Trap, the Harpoon Launcher, or the Blood Vulture. The Chain Trap is the same as it is currently, but gets an extra pip of Rend and an extra one on top of that against monsters. So it's Rend 2 against any monsters you're up against. The Harpoon Launcher loses 2 inches of range, but aside from that is identical to how it is now. The big difference is the Blood Vulture, which is not just an ability anymore where you roll a d6 and on a 2-up do a mortal wound to an enemy unit that's visible. Now it is an actual weapon. It's got a 24-inch range, it hits on 2s, wounds on 3s, and it has no rend and is just 1 damage. So I would say it's a lot worse than it is at the moment, and I would say if it was me, I would be going for the Harpoon Launcher or the Chain Trap, 99% of the time. The stone skeleton of his stone horn no longer gives that sweet 5-up ward either, so he's lost some durability there. Instead, it now just lets you ignore the first point of damage allocated to him each phase, which, I mean, isn't a bad ability. It can definitely help you stay alive against chip damage as you're allocated it through the hero phase, the shooting phase, and the, the fight phase. I just don't think it's quite as good as that always-on, always-reliable 5-up ward. And then he also has a new once per turn ability, which is done in any combat phase, 
which is called Everwinter's Goad. And what this does is it allows you to pick each enemy and friendly monster within engagement range of him, and for each of them you roll a d6. On a 3+, for the friendly units, all of their companion weapons have the crit 2 hits ability, so essentially exploding 6s to hit for the rest of the turn, and all enemy units on that 3+, have minus 1 to hit for their companion weapons for the turn. So this can be really good if you've got a few monsters in a big melee rumble with a few enemy monsters. Companion attacks can in some cases be the bigger, scarier, more damage ones, so making them hit more for you or hit less for the enemy can definitely, definitely swing a combat in your favour. So I think this is a nice little ability. It definitely makes the Huskard on Stonehorn a very solid, reliable pick if you are, again, leaning heavily into a monster-based force. The main troops for the Ogres are their Gluttons, and for a standard equivalent of a troop choice compared to other armies, these guys are pretty chunky. With 4 health, they can definitely take a punch despite only having a 5-up save. They don't really have much special in the way of their own War Scroll rules, and their weapons are still relatively basic, although they have changed um, based on the new way that GW are doing, like the generic kind of human orc stat lines for, for attack profiles. So these now have four attacks that hit on fours, wound on twos, with one rend and two damage. So it's not super terrifying, but still a full unit of six can be throwing out 24 attacks and doing nearly 12 damage or so to an enemy four up save unit. So they can do a solid bit of work in big enough numbers. Where they really shine though is at holding objectives. They have got a base control of two and that gets bumped to three each after they have used your Feast of Flesh battle trait and that means that a unit of six can have a control score of 18 which is going to make them incredibly difficult to shift once they're dug in on an objective. And then finally we get shown the Gorgia More Pack. These have got some brilliant new models and they also get some updated rules. They are still super squishy with just a 6-up save, although having 5 health does help that somewhat. And then they have 5 attacks that, like the other ogres, hit on 4s, wound on 2s with 1 rend and 2 damage. So they can again do a fair bit of work. They are even better against infantry because they go up to 2 rend against infantry, so they can rip through squishy infantry units really, really quickly. And then in terms of their own War Scroll rules, they have a nice little Deep Strike style ability. They can set up in reserve, lurking on the fringes with their Troglodytic Lurkers rule, and then they can appear 9 inches from a battlefield edge and 9 inches away from enemies in your movement phase with Frenzied Hunters. And this obviously can get them around the board a lot more easily and get them where you need them. It can also quite nicely set them up for a long charge if they are supported by Kragnos. If you move Kragnos up and they appear within 12 inches of him, they will get his ability to roll 3d6 for their charge roll. So even though they are 9 inches away from the enemy, you can quite reliably get them into combat with your opponent if they are supported by Kragnos. So that is a potentially nice play with them and could get them into an enemy flank really quickly and just completely devastate a big enemy infantry squad. And that is the Ogre Moor tribes. I mean, they do seem fairly straightforward and just Hulk smash, but that's not always a bad thing. They are a simple, easy to start, easy to play army that I hope will have a bit more complexity as we see the full index. But I think the fact that they are small in number because they are going to be sort of multi-wound, expensive, points-wise models. But I think they're going to be a, a small army to play that is going to be simple and straightforward and easy to understand. So if you are a new player to AOS, this could be a really easy way to get a new army started and get to grips with the game and just have a simple army to, to chuck onto the board and charge into the enemy. But as always, I'd love to know what you think. Do you like these rules? And do you think the Ogres are going to be a threat on the battlefields of 4th edition. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and as always, thank you very much for watching. Please do like and subscribe for more Warhammer content from me, but until next time, I'll catch you later guys.